Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are logging on. Um, thank you so much for joining us in this fifth series of our new Education Normal Webinar series. For those who are joining us the first time, this is a whole webinar series initiated by the Learning Sciences and Innovation Group in the Office of Educational Research in NIE. So in this series, we have invited um, researchers from international and local to share their work and insights and just to continue to lead us into the new way of teaching and learning in this new time. Um, for today, we have Jim with us. Um, Jim is a professor and president chair in knowledge technology at OAZ in the University of Toronto. Um, for many years, he has led teams of students, designer, engineer, to investigate new model of collaboration and inquiry. So um, he has developed also a pedagogical model known as knowledge community and inquiry. On a personal note, this is so early in the morning and I'm actually not looking at myself. I'm not sure whether. John, is this on? Okay. Sorry. So, on a personal note, I have a good fortune to be um, Jim's student. And each time I talk to him, and he will, I will have to end up reading about five to 10 papers. And, and that shows the wealth of knowledge that he has to share with us. So without much further ado, I'm gonna pass the time to Jim and for him to talk about scripting and orchestration of learning community, moving from classroom to blended inquiry design. I'm gonna pass the time to Jim, but I just wanna remind everybody that there is a question and answer button at the bottom of the screen. Yeah, encourage to put in your question and answer there. Mm -hmm. And at the end of Jim's talk, we'll have half an hour where we can discuss this question and, and answer. And you can also put in the chat, um, you can put into the panelists and we'll address to that as well. So we'll, if you have any technical question, there's an email that you can send to the oer.pubs. And I'll pass the time to Jim and we'll see you back um, together for a discussion in a while. Jim? Hi, everyone <clears throat> from Toronto. And I know enough about Singapore because I've been there a couple of times. <clears throat> and uh, I know that you're leading the world in this pandemic response, um, which is, makes it very interesting to me to hear that you're already talking about the new normal as if things did not go back to the way they were before. I think here in Canada, I think in the US and in, in Europe, <clears throat> you've seen that we have, uh, we've had a lot of difficulty with this disease and we do think about what will happen afterwards when there's a vaccine and when we have, uh, you know, when we have a, some return to normal. But I, I think some of us might still be hoping that it will be, you know, something like what it used to be <clears throat> but maybe you're telling us that, that, that that's not true because you're already sort of on the other side and maybe it has shown up for, for your world that things aren't going to go back. And uh, I think it's a, reasonable, um, it's a reasonable idea that it wouldn't <clears throat> because there are some things that we're discovering through the pressure of this, this kind of uh, coerced response. Uh, some things about working virtually the opportunities that come from it, just the fact that some things were, that seemed would be really hard are not as hard to do, that we can trust the technology more than we maybe thought. And so, so perhaps it, it's true that when, <clears throat> when Canada finally comes through this and we have no more of this disease, we will still find ourselves in a new normal. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if I hope for that or not. <laughs> You're going to see from my research today that I'm not the kind of, I don't do the kind of work that celebrates e-learning. Um, I'm a big fan of face-to-face. -face. I'm a big fan of the physical classroom. In fact, a lot of my work I've been known for is about these rich learning environments that use the room as something more than a container 
for the learning. And I'm going to talk about that today anyway, because that's <clears throat> that's the kind of thing that I have I, that I can talk about. I will move from that into sort of some discussion of what my group has been doing in this pandemic time and maybe some ideas about where we think things can go in the future. And I'll try to identify some transferable principles from the work that I've been doing that can help us imagine um, some powerful learning designs uh, going forward, no matter what the normal might turn out to be. So, can I use arrows? Yes, I can. Okay. <clears throat> so this talk is basically giving thanks to many people, some of them not even on this list. And when we're not in a pandemic, this is what we might have looked like. Uh, Julie will remember. A large group of researchers, teachers, uh, students, um, technology designers, information scientists, uh, working in different kinds of problems and projects, a, a lot of different kinds of technologies. And I will try to, um, <clears throat> to give you a taste of that work today. So the overview very, very quickly is that I'll start off by talking about a learning community and the, the kinds of work that characterize learning communities. I'll introduce a model that uh, Julie mentioned that we've developed here and we've been working on. And I'll talk a little bit about what kind of technology, in particular, this notion of scripting and orchestration and how those technologies can play a role. And then walk through several examples from our research. Doing that, I'll try to identify some principles that might <clears throat> translate into the new normal. And then pandemic pivots. I'll just talk about some of the things that we were forced to do uh, this year, as we were um, knocked sideways by, you know, all these PhD students planning these studies in their uh, different classroom settings, and um, it's more than just working at home. And you you probably understand that, but it was uh, a significant uh, mental burden on teachers and others to to have this lockdown hit the way it did. So it wasn't so straightforward as just designing new <clears throat> online solutions. Um, but I will then talk a little bit at the end about maybe how it, it will be different. So some of the questions that we ask in our group is, you know, how can we design curriculum so students work as a learning community? Can this approach help students learn more than just content, engaging them in authentic practices, discourse, and argumentation? How can the learning environment, both the physical and technological, scaffold student and teacher interactions? So these designs that I'll talk about are very complicated, more than what a teacher would rightfully be able to control, like maybe automatically grouping students based on what they, they did in a previous activity or feeding them materials based on the things they're interested in. Like a teacher can't do that. Um, so how can the technology environment help? What's the role of the teacher in guiding these activities? If it's not lecturing, what should the teacher be doing? And then finally, there's a good question about how to represent these designs, um, something besides words. We use a lot of words in academia. We need some formal symbols. Um, <laughs> you're gonna hear me talk about design, design, a lot of design, everything design, design process, design thinking, learning designs, interaction designs, co-design, <clears throat> design-based implementation research. So a lot of the, the flavor of work that we do in our group is related to design in various kinds and angles uh, of, uh, application of that term. So to start, just um, to mention learning communities, there's a couple of good papers by Alan Collins and Kate Milachek that review the notion of a learning community that talk about some of the common aspects of it. Ann Brown was another one who introduced uh, the Fostering Communities of Learners and Scardamalia and Bereiter here at Toronto <clears throat> have become quite famous with the knowledge building approach, which is a subset of the learning community approaches. In general, there's a focus on collective progress. Um, peers don't compete with each other for grades. They actually collaborate with each other and they benefit from one another. They understand that the progress of the community is something that they all share as a value. There's an emphasis on student contributed materials. Traditionally in the 20th century, a lot of the content for learning was developed by the teacher or by the curriculum authors, right? And in, in this kind of web 2.0 era, we've started to see a lot of user contributed content, right? Um, Wikipedia was empty in the beginning. 
um, YouTube. <laughs> These are all only work because of people putting stuff in. And so I think in the learning community approach, you'll see quite an emphasis on designing templates and, and maybe page headers, but then getting students to fill those in and to, to work on it. Um, a lot of interdependent groups, small groups, jigsaw groups, tasks that produce content that is used later on in the activity. And then finally, uh, very importantly, is a notion of shared discourse where there's a there's common language and common reference about the progress of the community and how we are making progress and what we need to work on next and whether this is working for us. And that kind of discourse has been studied by some in the research community. So you can imagine the challenges, some of them. First of all, covering content. If you want to try that approach, let's say in secondary <coughs> science like physics, how do you get the depth without sacrificing the breadth? As well, how do I support the complexity of this kind of design when I have all these kids running around in different groups and I'm reassigning them and I'm sending them materials and I'm having them, you know, uh, re jigsaw and get back in and, and try to access the community knowledge. This could be a very complicated thing to have happen in a classroom for even if you have researchers in the room helping. So that's obviously a challenge. Um, how do I get the community knowledge or the community resources and make those available and accessible to everybody? How do I assess student progress? How do I give feedback? <clears throat> and then finally, there's an interesting one about the meta knowledge. Um, teachers and students bring their own ideas and understandings about teaching and learning. And if you tried this kind of approach with a traditional classroom where everyone coming in had you know, ideas that were more conventional, it's gonna, it's gonna be problematic. So we, we have to think and address the epistemological uh, perspective of, of all of the people in the room to help them understand that this is a different way of learning. <clears throat> There's different values and different elements at play. So just to introduce scripting and orchestration, I promise that I won't have all just words on the screen. And uh, unfortunately as a screen sharer, I'm only able to see my slides in full view here. So I can't actually see, they told me I would see the chat but I'm only seeing a full screen of my slides. So we'll, um, if anybody needs to reach me, just talk and, inter and interrupt, okay? <clears throat> Scripting and orchestration is a, it's a pretty well-known um, area of work in the learning sciences. It was introduced by people like Frank Fischer in Germany or Pierre Dillenberg, who's in Switzerland. And they, the notion of a script is something like a, a theater script, where they, you specify everything about the roles and the groups and the materials and the activity and the logic, you know, when does it change and <clears throat> what's the uh, new conditions. There can be open-ended scripts that we don't know where it's going to go until we find out where the students were working. Uh, knowledge building is that kind of a script. Um, and then orchestration is essentially how to make that script come to life in the enactment. So how do I support the teacher and the students, the scaffolds, and also some of this kind of real-time analytics and learner modeling that might happen? So some serious technology. What kind of human-computer interaction is involved? Maybe there's some ambient displays and representations that change over time that make the discourse, give moments of opportunity for discourse. So just another, another piece of uh, the puzzle for me has to do with pedagogical models. So the learning sciences lacks models. There aren't a lot of them. Um, most sciences do have models and they have other kinds of formalisms. And I think if we had more of these in our, in our scientific community, we would, um, we would make faster progress. So model for me, you know, it specifies structural, structural and fun functional elements. There are some examples, FCL was kind of a model. Dillenberg had some scripts anyway that were models. Collaborative argumentation and collaborative reasoning from Richard Anderson is something like a model. Basically, these things can design our, can guide our design of the scripts. So they, they offer productive constraint. In uh, Bill Sandoval's um, model of uh, design-based research, he, he would have some concept of 
conjecture mapping. And models essentially do the same thing. They, they represent requirements and principles that are part of a coherent um, pedagogical pattern. So they're testable. I can tell you right off the bat, I can tell you if something is designed according to my model. I can see if it's violated. Um, and they're approvable. So there's a lot of work that's relevant and interesting about models. Here's a model. Um, this is one that we've been building called Knowledge, Community, and Inquiry. And I'll walk you through it quickly here, but you can essentially see there's a lot of boxes and arrows the way models have. And <clears throat> there's a community knowledge base here where you can imagine this being as a giant um, meta tagged cloud of ideas and notes and resources or photos or images or videos or anything the community is kind of curating. There's some work that they're doing here in the orange box to populate that, but it's the resource here for this red box, which is called scaffolded inquiry activities. And this is a place where we differ from knowledge building a bit. Uh, we actually tell the kids what to do. We want them to learn Newton's second laws. We want them to do this activity just the way we told them. Okay, but it's an inquiry activity, so they're gonna they can put anything they want in there as long as they follow our our scaffolds. Um, these inquiry activities are tricky to design. They need to use the knowledge base that we don't even know necessarily what's up there when we start. They need to listen to the community voice, so they're guided by the interests and and people and directions of interest of, in the community but they also need to be accountable to the learning goals and that are required by the curriculum. <clears throat> to do that, they have to, these magic red box items have to produce accessible learning outcomes that can be scored to see if the kids learned, okay? So that's a model. Doesn't give you a lot because there's a magic in here. There's a black box in this red box. We don't really know how to make these inquiry activities. And so that's still some work to do, which is the kind of research that we've been doing. So I'll just walk Jim, through some of, hello? Jim, I'm just yeah. going to interrupt. There is a question from Leon um, Tan on the chat. Do you want yeah. me to read up? Or? Yeah, because I can't see the chat. I just see, yeah. I wish you could see what so I can he, see. Yeah, he's uh -huh. asking, um, can we consider the pedagogical patterns by Lorillard as a pedagogical models? Are they the same? So you can do it now or you can keep it for later for the question. Um, I, I think instructional design is related, yes. And I think Lorillard is one of the leaders in instructional design. It, there's not easy to find <clears throat> good patterns uh, for design of instruction. Um, you know, her books are one of the references that people typically will cite. And so I think that some of these activities could be guided by that kind of, those kind of patterns. Of course, you still have to obey the other constraints of the model. So. You'll see when I kind of show you, but I, but I think having the instructional design community as a kind of connector to this learning sciences work is, is certainly valuable. So some of the elements that we have in the model are that there's an epistemological piece of it. We're all in this together. We need that we tell the students, this is different. You are gonna be learning differently. You've seen web 2.0, you've seen you know Wikipedia, you've seen how we build stuff together in social media. That's gonna be like this. Um, we're gonna make a knowledge base where you guys are contributing the content. We're gonna have collaborative projects that use that knowledge base. And we're gonna have some assessment. And <clears throat> then uh, these are just kind of some of the elements of the model. And the model is cast in terms of principles. Right now, those are, these have changed a bit from year to year, uh, but this is at least one version of the principles. Uh, students work collectively. They create a knowledge base that serves as a resource. Um, which we've already talked about. For each of these principles, um, at, you know, the, the kind of scholarship we're doing here is we define a set of dimensions. So epistemological commitments, pedagogical affordances, and technological elements that kind of that kind of mm -hmm. define that principle in three different dimensions. And you can think of these dimensions as kind of a design triangle or a, a set of design tensions. If I change the pedagogy, that puts pressure on the epistemic and the technological, right? If I, if I have to do this on a different kind of technology, that'll put pressure on the pedagogy. That sort of, those of you who know about, you know, activity systems can imagine this rough mapping in the same space where you can sort of uh, understand that each of these elements is kind of a part of an activity system in essence, but that, that will be in the form of a principle. So that's a very loose connection to activity systems, but I always notice 
that it feels similar. There's three more principles. I'm not going to go into the PET dimensions of each one, but the knowledge base is a core resource. It's got to be accessible for editing improvement. Collaborative inquiry activities <clears throat> use that resource. They target the learning goals. And the teacher's role must be clearly specified within the script. This is something that's not done very often in educational research or in the learning sciences, where frequently our innovations or our interventions are sort of indulged by the teacher or tolerated by the teacher. <clears throat> we give the teacher some assignment like guide on the side and we tell them, you know, just try to be helpful or just talk to students. It's very dismissive and it's very, I won't say insulting, but it's, it's not a strong role for the teacher who's used to being at the front and center, directing everything, inventing everything. And so when we come in from, from educational research and we say, we got this great new approach that's gonna have, you know, intelligent tutoring and you know, all this stuff and teacher, you just have to, you know, <clears throat> help. That's not the way uh, KCI wants things to be. We want to see the teacher as something that this will fail completely if they're not playing a very clearly specified role within the script. In, in addition to having overall responsibility. And then finally, just to say the students in this, um, in, the students in a KCI curriculum are not, um, I'm not ignoring the fact that each one is going through their own learning trajectory. I do believe that the design of these activities are, even when you're working in a student group, we're, we're thinking of the individual student as a learner. I write, you know, I put a picture here of a bubble chamber, which is sort of like, I don't know what spin you have coming into these fields. I just know what fields I'm gonna make and I'm hoping to give you some direction this way. And uh, each student's gonna kind of bubble through this thing, <clears throat> interacting as we designed with peers, materials and, and uh, the, the learning environment. Some work to do there, obviously. So we use a kind of a, a method called model-based design research. I'm kind of connecting it to some of the design-based research in the, in the uh, literature, but with a model. And there's not many of those. So uh, we're trying to understand exactly what that means. And it, it typically means you design something, it's beautiful because it hasn't been used. <laughs> and so everyone loves it. You could write it up in your paper. Like, this is what I designed. It was wonderful. You should have, you know, <laughs> it was perfect until we ran it. And whether we ran it, we'll get, we find out what, what really happened, okay? What really happened is something not what we designed. And so um, we learn from that cycle. We can evaluate both. Did the model, did the design implement the model? If no, then, you know, I don't know what to do with you. <laughs> if you didn't, at least the design should implement the model. I don't know about the implementation, but that's a second part of the, the model-based design research. Typically the KCI units that we make are whole semester units. And that's because it's not easy to, to just switch on and off a community mode. So we'll typically work with a teacher and at least we'll build, a, um, you know, a six week unit, often a semester unit. And it's all done in co-design. Nothing's ever been or ever will, I think, work without the teacher as the, the co-designer and the one that actually runs the thing. It, uh, it's the only way you can make sure the teacher actually owns it, understands it, and wants to use it. So there have been quite a number of the studies. Uh, these are just a few. Um, these are mostly PhD projects, as you see here on the right. They've looked at everything from a lot of secondary science, Canadian biodiversity, climate change, um, biodiversity in 11th grade, 12th grade physics. And I'm gonna tell you about some of these uh, today. So just this one I used because it's, um, it was the first one we ever made and it's not a bad illustration of the kind of collective use of a knowledge base. I'm gonna go through it quickly because I have a lot to, to cover. So I'll try to give some social um, <clears throat> annotation and credit to people who worked on these things. And, and uh, Chu Lee remembers Vanessa. So she was really just in the, first, the first one to go and sort of what does KCI even look like? What does that mean to design activities that require the knowledge base as a resource? And we actually didn't know any of this. So that's kind of a neat thing about this one. Um, this was a, a short lesson. I think it was only four class periods long. It was on internal body systems, so respiratory, circulatory, and digestive. There were 102 students in four class sections. 
okay, this is cool because there aren't very many interventions that I've seen that actually um, connect students across four different sections of a course. There were three teachers as well. So three different teachers with four different class sections combined all their students to build this knowledge base. Why, why do I have to build four or you know three or four knowledge bases? Can't we all use the same one and benefit even more? That had, I had never seen anything like that in, in educational research before this. So that was, uh, this was in 2009 or eight. So we built a wiki and the wiki consisted of wiki, uh, wiki pages that were not, um, diseases. So we had respiratory diseases, circulatory diseases and digestive diseases. <clears throat> we assigned students to one of those categories. So count off by threes, your, your respiratory, your circulatory, your digestive. And then we made, and this is before Google Docs, right? This is when Wiki was new and we actually built a Java front end for Wiki. We built some, some scaffolds where they could name their disease and talk about, put the meta tag here, which one it was a summary and who the authors were. And then once they hit submit, it became a, a, an editable, socially editable wiki. They could edit each other's pages, okay? But only within their specialization. So only the circulatory pages would I have permission. So on those pages, once you hit enter from that cover page that made it, um, it gave you, I should have made a blank one of these, but it sort of said, what's a short summary? This must be what they wrote on the cover page. You can edit that now. You know, how does the disorder affect the system physically? How does the disorder affect the biological system? So we gave them these headers and we said, you can put anything you want on here, but you have to, you know, do the headers. So this is an example of scripting. And they, they did a lot of edits on these. Um, there's 23 of them. The average number of revisions you can see here was something like, you know, 10 or 15, they were very long. They were, some of them were hundreds, like 2000 words long, lots of photos and images. The students really enjoyed building them. Um, that was the, so that was the knowledge co-construction. And then we got into these red boxes. You know, how are we gonna do this so that they have to use, they need this knowledge base. So what we did is we asked them to create and solve disease cases. Okay, and we built another wiki scaffold for them. Create a fictitious medical case for one disease in your specialization. <clears throat> okay, so students had to go look at all of the respiratory diseases and we said, you know, be creative with your title, especially. So Snow White and the Seven Smokers. This was probably emphysema, right? And Snow White lives with seven dwarves. They're all smokers. Some of them are chain smokers and they had to kind of do the patient history, the symptoms and all that stuff. And then they had, after they were done creating one of these, they had to go solve two other ones. And those had to be from the other two specializations. So now they need the wiki. They need the digestive and the circulatory systems to, to do that task. So this was kind of cool. They all had to kind of work to build the materials for the other ones to solve. And they loved it. They actually, they were supposed to do two. Most of them did all, like just, they just loved doing these. They, 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 um, the teachers were amazed. Um, and were there, there were pretty good assessments on this one because there was an exam that didn't change from one year to the next. And so we were able to check, we were, for, you know, we were able to check the improvement on the physiology score against any possible improvements on the other two, um, on the other major units. So in the overall exam, from the previous two years, they didn't make any change, but in physiology, they went up. So that was um, exciting. And that kind of shows you at least the first one that we built. Uh, they got a lot more complicated as we went on. So we started down this road of thinking about the room. And we said, why do kids just sit in chairs and look at the front of the room? You know, shouldn't the walls be active? Shouldn't they be moving around the room? Can't the room itself be part of the the learning environment and um, and we can actually use that and we can know where they are and, and have that be a factor and use that in our design of scripts. We were also starting to get interested in embodied learning, tangible and physical elements of the room. Um, and we invented a, a technology to kind of support that. You can imagine in this thing, or we certainly do, that there's a role for learning analytics, real-time learning analytics, not this kind of big data, stuff, which I'm sure is important, but for us, it's 
almost more like intelligent tutoring or student modeling or or things where we're we're using a server in the back end to kind of run agents that are looking for patterns and matching those patterns. Uh, and so we're using those applications in KCI to, to help group process, uh, to help the feed, you know, give input to the teacher and guided discourse. I mentioned intelligent agents. So these are kind of little software bots that sit in the back and, and do what their job is. Maybe they're supposed to wait until a group has achieved a certain state and then they change the assignments for that state. They can control ambient displays. They can execute the scripting logic. Um, and we've worked on a variety of these agents over the years. We've been developing technology environments. This one is called SCALE, the Scalable Architecture for Interactive Learning. It's into, it's about third or fourth major version now. Um, we use it to kind of do that real time changing that uh, this used to be magic, you know, until you saw Google Docs and you could start seeing each other's characters appear on the screen. And now everybody just expects all the stuff to work this way. It didn't used to, it used to be very hard to program this stuff um, where something changes, everybody else's gets update, not when you hit, you know, refresh, when it's actually just happening. So all of that uh, information um, architecture has been um, evolving quickly over the years. And so we're into like our fourth version of it. Um, but out of that has come this notion of smart classrooms for learning communities. How do I use a room to kind of support and orchestrate an, a, a learning community script? So I'm gonna show you uh, some examples. This is example one, not two. Um, the first one is physics, and I'm not going to go deep into these because it'll it'll take way too much. Each one of them would be a whole talk, right? So I'm just going to give you a taste of where what the context was, and what some of the interactions were, and <clears throat> show you a video for each one. So this was uh, two physics classes um, in a 12th, I think it was 12th grade, and there were a variety of activities in the scripts. They used their own physics examples and photos and challenge problems that they created. There was a final smart classroom activity where they had to, they were shown Hollywood video clips like uh, Fast and the Furious where one car jumps on a ramp and the other car jumps the same ramp afterwards and passes the first car in the air and lands in front of it. And is that, is that possible? Those of you with physics background are thinking now, is that possible? I guess it could be possible. And so we were asking the students the same thing and the, the A team or they, they were falling in a tank and they used the the tank gun to shoot and move the tank till it fell in a lake. So we, we came up with four of these and we put them around the room in different locations. And that students were supposed to work as a community in solving, first of all, thinking about setting up, coming up with the, um, what assumptions you know you can make, what's the mass of the tank, the mass of the bullet, and how can we set up that problem to even try to solve. So this work was done by Mike Tissenbaum, who's now at the University of Illinois, and he was interested in intelligent agents um, to support orchestration. So using them to create emerging learning objects, orchestrate the logic, get the materials and give it away and coordinate the ambient features and support learning across contexts, which is relevant to our topic today. And here's just a picture of the kids looking at this video. Essentially, they were they, they started to work in one video and they would do a step of the setup problem, like um, talk about which of the physics principles connect to that video. And then all of a sudden, the room would move them to another video and regroup them with other students. And so the agents were busy working the room to make sure that each student ended up seeing all four videos, which mapped to four, uh, four different sets of physics principles. And so I'm going to circle every time I get to a, what I think is a potential transferable principle for the learning that we'll do in the new normal. So physical and locational dependencies or, or group dependencies would be one. We used a lot of ambience in this. So this was a front board that gave the students an update of where they were and were they in the green zone? You know, where are they supposed to be working? And, and is green, you keep doing your job. When it's yellow, you better hurry because you're about to be out of time. And that really did help everybody keep track. And so ambient awareness is another one we'll bring forward with us. A lot of tools and materials that were specifically designed for this. We created this complicated 
collaborative group wear where the kids all stood in front of a projector. They had one, it was like a giant, you know, combined laptop and they had multiple inputs, but they had one projector and they were, they were dragging and uh, swiping things around. And it was, uh, it was quite the scaffold. You, you can certainly read more about this. There's several papers about this study, but scaffolded inquiry tools are another one. Oh, that must be the fast and the furious ramp there. Um, and more, we built tools for the teacher. Um, we actually wrote a long paper about teacher tablets. The teacher tablet in our study worked so well that the teacher got mad at us and told us to take it away from him because he couldn't stop looking at it. And he said, I love this thing. I love it too much. <laughs> you have to take it away. I don't want all the information. I need to go back to my students, right? So that was very interesting. A teacher could do things like pause the whole room, right? Um, and, and move students at will. So those are kind of things that we were looking at in that study. And just a quick video to show you, you know, what it looked like. I might, I'm not gonna watch this whole thing, but let's see what's there. You hear they're swiping, whether a principal, seeing whether the principal belong on that video or not. They're sorting physics problems to see if they can find similar problems. I'm not sure what this, at the end they had to solve the problem, so I think that's a good out sequence. Here's the room moving people around, and now here they go, moving about. We were very excited by this. There's an Iron Man flying through the air, I guess they're going to solve that problem. the teacher. That guy in the background, you'll see him in a lot of these kind of studies because he's a technologist trying to make sure all this stuff is working well, right? <clears throat> and you almost always have him in these kind of studies. So th this thing was, uh, it was very big project. I would almost call it big science for the learning sciences. We had a lot of people working on it. We also did some work on formalisms, and there's a couple of views here just to show you what that work looked like. You know, this is actually a pictorial look of the, in, in this thing, if I were to show you the whole thing, it was about, <clears throat> I don't know, 10 meters long, right? Because <laughs> it ran through the whole script. And then he had, he had descending layers of information, including a social information at the bottom, where we were actually adding our own comments to each of these steps. And then we turned it into, you, you know, um, UDL and um, he also developed a an agent symbolic representation. These clouds are the different agents. So this is all to try to move and we didn't get much further on this, I'm afraid, but the idea here was if I wanted to try to show that whole design that I briefly showed you in a video, if I wanted to try to write that up so that another scientist could understand what I did. Right now, what we have to use are essentially English or some other language with paragraphs and words, and it would be pages. And I would have to do this exhausting description, whereas other scientists have, you know, calculuses and, and symbolic formalisms to, to represent their designs. And, and I think this is a really important um, a really important space for us to work in, to think about how, you know, you see colors here, you see shapes here, you see flow here. Um, and again, this is only a small part of this script. So if you're gonna have scripting and orchestration, I think there needs to be some work on scripting language. And of course that would ultimately be machine readable, right? So you could actually imagine in the future, <laughs> some kind of learning environment that all you did was feed it the script and it would go. So another example here, just to give you a flavor of the work is Evo Room. Check my time. Um, Evo Room is a was an immersive room sized simulation, kind of like a cave, and it was done for high school biology, twelfth grade, and it was also part of a, a larger KCI design. As was the the place the physics video I just showed you. That was a culminating activity of a semester long KCI design. So I didn't have time to go into all of the user contributed content and inquiry and all that stuff. But that smart room was just the kind of purpose of that example. And, and this is the sim, a similar. Uh, this particular student was a, a medical science person, a design person. She was really interested in you know, how a 
group of people could go into a room and have that room mediate their inquiry um, through simulations. She was also interested in learning across contexts, which is another piece of our, our, our new normal, right? Uh, Michelle Louis was the primary PhD researcher on this. Uh, she's now a postdoc working here at uh, University of Toronto in the information school. And she was interested in questions like, how can this actually support collective inquiry? What kind of interaction patterns are there? How should these simulations be embedded within the larger, larger curriculum? And so I'll just show you a video right off the bat of what this looked like. And again, pay attention to where the bodies are. You know, they're not sitting and looking at the front of the room. They are in motion, they are in groups. There's a variety of information sources. So this was very exciting to us at this time because we were really asking questions about the room and can the room be a mediator of the learning? And what, what happens to the teacher in that kind of a room? Whoops, I'm sorry, that was wrong of me. You'll see representations at the front of the room that emerge over time. You'll see animated representations on the side walls. You'll see groups of students sitting and walking around, and the teacher will occasionally be come into view. There she is now talking to some students. That's Evo Room. Um, Evo Room featured these large projectors. It was a rainforest in Southeast Asia, and um, a lot of kind of focus on ambience. At the front of the room was this kind of cladogram or this emergent representation. A cladogram shows all the species and, and how they descended from other species over time. And so that room that you saw, we actually could play that room through time. We could advance it from 200 million to 150 to 100. And each time the, the representations on the side walls changed. And so the students could actually develop that emergent cladogram at the front of the room uh, by going through the scaffolds that we created for them. So just some of the design features of the room, you see that front board that has that emergent cladogram. Um, I, wa I wanna mention that again, this room, you see the green dots, this room came into play three times. Once we did biodiversity, where we just used the room at the current two million years ago um, state two million years ago until today. And then two times later, we actually um, addressed evolution. And in the intervening time, this was a big KCI design that involved field trips to the zoo, homework, classwork. And, you know, that's kind of situating these, these intense interactions within a broader curriculum is another one of these takeaway principles. A really cool feature of this project was the students helped us. We talked to them in the beginning, you know, kind of right after this one. Um, we said, you know what? We're gonna actually build this room to go through time and we need your help. We are gonna assign you all to one of these eight time periods and you gotta go find out who lived back then in this, this rainforest and what species they came from and what species came from them. And we're gonna work with a designer. You're gonna actually work with a designer who's gonna kind of build this into the room. And so the kids got really into this they generated, they essentially generated and helped build the knowledge base of all these different creatures and when they lived and a bit of the scaffolding for the sort of handbook that were used to solve the inquiry challenge, like which of the following was most likely the ancestor of um, this monkey, right? And so you got to pick which one and you can go to the, you can go to the handbook and read about it. So the script came from that, you know, we built on those materials where they had to essentially get together. They had these groups. Anytime it was, the, if a student was a specialist in the 100 million year ago time, that student became a docent when the room was put into 100 million years, those students became the experts. So there was some excellent opportunities to connect to that whole uh, student um, assisted knowledge. Um, this is actually Michelle just narrating the the student materials. Whoops. Tablet to control the walls and leads the student through an overview of important historical geologic events through time. From 200 million years ago 
all the way up to 2 million years ago. Yeah, so you get a sense of what that room was about and some of the kind of features of it that you see this kind of cladogram here emerging. They must be at about 100 million. They're going to get to 50 and 25 and 5 and 10. And, and here's, here's modern day. And so this whole thing will show up as this interactive board where the teacher can touch any one of these, open it up and have discussions around it. These are large animated walls. They weren't touch walls. They were just animated. Um, small groups, solo action, that kind of emergent record at the front of the room, teacher-led student interactions. And again, we worked hard on, you know, how to represent this. There was something like 37 smaller applications in the Evo room alone. It was a very large three-year project. Um, here's the kind of UDL look at this. And, and so I'm not gonna have time to go more deeply into that just for to make sure I get through <laughs> my talk, but these were some of the things that we were working on, uh, you know, and now you're asking us to think about post pandemic and is it ever gonna go back to rooms where we were just starting to investigate getting kids out of their chairs and out of the rows and out of listening to the teacher at the front of the room and the deep role of the room in the learning. And now you're asking us to leave the room so you can imagine you couldn't have picked a worse person to, to talk to you about this stuff. But I'm going to give you another example that's even more interesting. And this is work I've done now for a decade with Tom Moore. He's a computer scientist from the University of Illinois, Chicago. And Jim, um, yeah. there is another comment on the chat that I'm just going to read out. Without sure thing. Yeah. So this is from Penny Wheeler, and she's saying that I appreciate the need to develop formalism, but is there a way to create a, in bracket, scripted video recording that would communicate the design adequately? If you need more elaboration, we can actually um, do it later, yeah. Yeah, I, I think the use of video is obviously, that a picture is worth a thousand words, right? And we, all, we always develop videos but again, you got to think about the, the normal lonely learning scientist out there in the world trying to do, you know, her work and how many skills does she need, you know, in this 21st century work? Um, do we, does she now have to be a video, um, you know, producer? And, and it, is that her responsibility to create these kind of extensive video <clears throat> descriptions and documentaries and and so I think the idea of formalisms is to sort of simplify or at least make it more tractable. You know, the, the number of times I've had to describe all this stuff using paragraphs and paragraphs, even with pictures, it's, uh, it really begs, you know, this isn't rocket science what we're doing, it's get into a group, get some materials, hand them to an agent, do some work, change the thing. And, and this stuff should be scriptable. And if it's scriptable, it should be representable. Um, again, that said, we haven't exactly, um, you know, solved this problem. So it's just an interesting part of the challenge when you're working in these complicated learning community scripts that you end up needing to communicate and work with them. And it would be wonderful to have a kind of a calculus where I could compare two, or I could subtract one from another, or I could swap one into one if it fit the right conditions, or I could have machine readable, like there's all kinds of potential around that. So let, let me show you um, embedded phenomena. They're really cool. So embedded phenomena are you, you take the classroom and you embed a phenomenon in the room. So this one is called walkology. And we, we basically tell the kids there's invisible bugs in all the walls of the room. And they have life cycles. They go from egg to larvae to pupa to adult. We don't tell them that. We just say, hey, you know, there's all these weird things in your wall. And if you go over to that x-ray scope on the wall, you can see behind it, but it's everywhere. It's in the floors too. It's up in the ceiling, you know, but wherever we put one of these walls, you can see it. And so the kids kind of go over to the wall and they see, you know, an ecology there and different things are, are crawling around. We have hot water pipes. We have cold water pipes. We have slime. We have scum. We have uh, things eating each other. If you go forward and like you can see maybe little hatching events that happen. And when these happen, you know, whenever anything big happens, the kids are, are, um, are amazed, right? And they, they scream and the teacher comes running over. 
Um, and, and that's all we tell them. We just say that, I don't know, you figure it out, right? So it's a wonderful inquiry op opportunity for students in grade five, six to try to understand ecology and food web. And by the way, each wall in the room has a different temperature and a different humidity. Um, and so they have different creatures. Some of them have shared, but some of them just don't have this one or much fewer of it. And we can give them opportunities to graph and represent the number. We've updated that representation uh, now using Unity, which is unfortunately <laughs> now on its way out, but we, we did you know, much better representations in recent years. We had different camera angles they could look at and this kind of thing. But the kind of uh, tasks we gave them where, and I'll just show you a, a quick film of what that looks like. Uh, probably won't watch the whole thing, but you can get it again. Just to give you a sense of the bodies in motion and the way that people are looking at it, the teacher here and talking to their friends and really excited about when things happen in the walls. So there's the teacher, right, in a new way of interacting with the students. We were working with tablets in this one where the kids had ways of putting their own observations in. So it was a, it's a wonderful opportunity, as you can imagine, for the kids to work as a community because one student can't solve all this. There's too many observations. We don't know what turns into what, from egg to pupa to larvae. We don't know who eats what. We got to figure all that out together. And the teacher has to help us do that. So this is Rebecca Quintana. Um, she was interested in, well, if we're gonna do that, we're gonna need some way of showing the community knowledge as it gets advanced, as it moves forward. But there's a million ways to do that. And how do you know what's the right one, you know, when there's so many? And what kinds of discourse happen around these things? So she, we call these aggregate representations because they represented all of the observations of the class. And so just for example, here in this picture, you see the egg turns into the, the pupa, turns into the larva, turns into the adult. Well, how do we know that? Because we don't tell them. So we got to give them a, a tool. Every time they see something change, they should make an observation. And so this tool here we made where you literally just drag that egg down here, drag that green bug down here, and you're done. That just, you just added one observation to the class list, right? And um, over time, I think I actually have another slide of this. Yeah, okay, this is a little bit closer. Um, you just drag the blue thing, drag that thing, and you you hit enter. And over time, the teacher can go to the smart board at the front of the room and touch this green bug here and say, well, let's look at everybody that said what turned into it. So two of you said it, the, this thing turned into it. You know, eight of you said it turned into itself. Uh, 20 of you said this turned into it. So what do we think? Is it, is, do you think we can safely, and we had the paper up here at the front of the room, can we safely put them in this order? What should we do? And, and so this is a great opportunity. What if there's a conflict over here? What if like 12 people had said this one and, and you know, nine people had said this one? <clears throat> kind of like the US election. So the teacher loved that because now they can say, well, we have a disagreement. How are we gonna solve that? Right? And these are knowledge building teachers that have done the knowledge building pedagogy before. So they really love this ability to get the kids to start working as a scientific community. And Rebecca would, was looking at the discourse patterns that happened around these, um, the use of these aggregate representations. That was her, actually her master's thesis. Um, gonna keep going here because I now have to see my time is I'm gonna run out. So. The last one that I was gonna spend a little more time, but I'm just gonna quickly fast forward through was learning analytics for group process support. We understand that kids work in groups a lot. This is a picture of the classroom where we used to work in one of our schools. We have boards all around, we have tablets, we have computers, and 
the, the student was working on this was Elisa Acosta, and she was interested in how can learning analytics support these kind of group processes. So she developed working closely with the teacher, a bunch of activities that were kind of review activities followed by inquiry activities. The, the students worked together to build this kind of uh, semantic network of all the terminologies. This was again, I think grade 11 biology. And she was working across context. So home and the regular science class and then this kind of active learning classroom, okay. Grade 12, I'm sorry. And she developed a variety of tools that gave kind of learning analytic feedback of different kinds, you know, stars and bars and um, prompts and summaries. And she had views for the teacher and views for the students. The basic task was that they were trying to, and here you see the progress bar here, they're trying to define everything and interconnect everything in a semantic web. So once you've defined it, then you're going to have to come up with relationships between two terms and you're just kind of fed these by an agent. Uh, and if you get it wrong, you, you get feedback there. Um, and so she built with the teacher quite a lot of these kind of um, knowledge collection tools and then uh, representation tools. So all the gray ones aren't done yet. And so students can go in and do the ones that aren't done yet. And uh, she was building this kind of support technologies and, and progress technologies. Um, teacher got representations as well. And some of the kind of examples of the supports that she made were that she had people vet or, or confirm the definitions and you'd get a dot on your blue thing if you had vetted it. You got stars if you went above and beyond 100%. There was this concept map that represented the community knowledge. And so that learning analytics support for group processes is another one to bring forward. And the kind of orchestrational supports that she built, which were a little bit like scaffolds, were these various tools, uh, recommenders. You could call a conference if you needed one. So that would take you out of Jigsaw back into your original Jigsaw group. So your specialists all had to go back together and handle something. And the teacher actually had tools for supporting group formation. This is a nice dis dissertation. If anyone's interested in reading the full story on this, this is well, very well put together thesis. And I'm going to have to, you know, her results and her analyses that she produced were, you know, wonderfully complicated, as you can imagine, for a learning analytics and knowledge person. Um, and so I'm just going to have to go fast through these and not spend a lot of time talking about them. But she had positive, uh, positive results and positive results about the group process analytics in particular. Uh, these are just fantastically interesting to learning analytics people. They show high progress and mixed progress groups and the kind of cognitive and metacognitive idea connections that are being made there. So, well, that brings us to one hour. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend just a minute talking about <laughs> what happened to us. And it is different here than it was in Singapore and it was in Taiwan and it was in China even those countries got it under control and kept it under control. And in our countries, we've been, I haven't been in my building since March. So I'm still working from home every day. And uh, some of the schools are back in business. Uh, they're kind of going back, but with very restricted, you know, social distancing and masks. And I guess that's probably true in other places too, is that they are keeping social distance. So we're certainly not doing the kind of work that you saw there with active learning. And my work was in this, this kind of active learning space. Don't do the simulations of the touch walls anymore. We're thinking about the possibility of pushing these things into a home. And what does that mean? Of course, I'm not that interested in solving that problem. I don't really want us to figure out how to make home learning better. I wanna go back to school, but then we have, what, we have the situation that we have and I have the students who are working and they, they had to, to do this. Um, but they're doing it, it's not just changing the format where you now have to work at home. The teachers were really no energy left. And they, they didn't know how to teach online. They didn't have the energy to even talk to us about how to do it. It wasn't like we could help them. They were just exhausted and confused and distressed and nervous. And, you know, I can even say the word abused. I mean, they really put a lot on these teachers and the students weren't far behind them. And so the whole world, was kind of like, okay, 
we give up. They, they, they stopped doing grades, you know, they stopped doing all that. Every, every, uh, you know, so the whole, everything was sort of really open in the late spring of last year. And that was kind of cool in a way because it gave us a chance to experiment and to work with teachers on some of those things. Um, the things that I brought out in my slides above were things like location and group dependencies, ambient displays to show the kind of level that you're, uh, to show people where you are in the process, scaffolded tools and materials, building scripts around user contributed materials, situating interactions within a broader curriculum, um, representing collective knowledge and learning analytic support. So this parts of the work that I can, you know, that I was gonna talk about the pivots. There were two basic pivots that I was gonna speak about. One of them was actually from Wuhan in central China. And you see a picture here of Amy Lee, who's the PhD student was working on that. And she had this wonderful multi-million dollar smart classroom network with eight interconnected rooms and a math prof who was doing it. And here's the picture of it. And we were doing all this complicated scripting. We had identified these kind of cool patterns for modified peer instruction communities supported worksheets, community problem creation. We thought, here's some different ways these seven, if there's seven class, eight classrooms, how can the other seven help this one? How can these guys kind of game with each other to make this a really interesting network? And we had built that huge study. And then she, uh, and I was gonna go some slides to really talk about how these worked. What is this worksheet? This worksheet was two parts. One part was easy, it was math uh, calculus. One part was easy. The second part was impossible. You just couldn't do it. It was too hard. It was, that was interesting to build those materials. We wanted to make sure nobody could finish the second one, was, except maybe one kid out in classroom seven, right? One group, one small group. Those groups start publishing hints. And within, within the hour, everybody's got all the hints and everybody's managed to solve the second part of the worksheet. So that was a really cool design. I, I probably won't go through all the examples, but uh, that pattern worked for us and it was just starting to be implemented in a study. We had three other patterns. We had community problem creation. We had participatory problems and patterns where the, the classroom actually became the calculus and the, the physics. And then we had, um, we had peer instruction too, a PI system. And then came the lockdown right as we were starting. So, and of course, we're over here in Toronto. We're not locked down. That'll never happen here, right? But this was February and uh, we had the lockdown. So how do we pivot? Just to, to make sure I tell you the story before we have to wrap up. We've been developing a technology called SCORE. SCORE stands for Scripting and Orchestration Environment. It's a very intelligent technology and it goes into everyone's devices and it's got that scalable architecture working behind it. Um, we're working with orchestration graphs, which are something that Pierre Dillenberg has talked about. And the way that we kind of decided to move these materials and these experiences up online was to essentially map each activity into a score screen, uh, trying to give essentially the students a sense of whether they're in a group and how much time is in the group and what are they supposed to do and now you're going to do something, you're going to attempt the worksheet individually, five minutes, and now you're going to work collectively. And they, the, the idea was that SCORE, this kind of new learning management system, it's like a Moodle plus a Google Drive. So it's got collaboratively editable documents, and it's got a whole bunch of permission settings and intelligence behind it, and you can use it to do these kind of distributed collective and group activities. And we were using it in the classroom, but now we've begun to move it um, on to the online context for a couple of these students. For Amy, um, who's now living in Munich, <laughs> she's now busy analyzing that data. We actually did manage to move and did it with 380 students in a linear algebra course. She's analyzing it. And now also she's working with Frank Fischer in Germany to do uh, a similar study of of learning and mathematics, um, logic and proving. Um, and then this guy, Joel, he's the current, P one of the current PhD students here who's working on, on flipped classrooms moving into online mode, right? So 
he's helping uh, push active learning into the, the home space uh, by giving students kind of ways to collectively annotate lecture video, uh, practice their kind of interleaving and mastery learning. And so he's essentially been using SCORE to help them move from an individual learning mode to a kind of a learning community mode and help them understand that it's a culture of cooperation. So his, his the study that he's in right now, November 10th, <laughs> November 16th, is using SCORE. Uh, and I was gonna show you a demo of it, but um, essentially using SCORE in that same way where all the different screens come up and collective and, and collaborative groups meet and um, demo, we might have to wait for a demo because of the time. So just gonna, I, you know, I can show you that it's, it's a, it looks like an e-learning system, but it's more than an e-learning system because it, it has a script underneath it and it has more intelligence behind it and hopefully becoming more and more as we go. Um, some of the themes that I've talked about today are collective inquiry, changing patterns of discourse, scripting and orchestration, these models, this idea of a model, uh, scaffolding role of technology and <clears throat> orchestrating that script. I think implications for the blended designs that we're going forward to now do. First of all, that students and teachers, would they'd like something better than just classic e-learning. They know that they, there's other ways of interacting and, and we can bring these into their experience working from home. Scripting and orchestration, and in particular, kind of the notion of active learning, they can help inform how we move these patterns of scripted inquiry into these online courses. These models, I think like KCI can actually really help with this. And of course, there's you know, gotta be something better than Google or Moodle. Uh, needs to have intelligence, needs to have group process and orchestration support, teacher and TA support. Um, it's gotta basically have a discourse model uh, acknowledged. And so some of the things that we're looking at going forward now are for me, I'm very interested in student identity and motivation. I believe that students now more than ever need to know why they're in school. You know, you've got what you learn and you've got how you learn, but you also have why you learn. And we know a lot that how you learn, you know, changes what you learn. Um, but why, <laughs> why am I doing any of this? Why am I even in school? We have big problems in the West with kids not even knowing why they're in school. We have this idea of school strikes that students are doing. So kind of thinking a lot about motivation, identity, even career and, and sort of STEM identity, which is a, a topic in the literature. Epistemic conditioning, how do we get kids used to thinking about ways of knowing? And of course, I'm always interested in teacher knowledge and practice. Um, so that's my work uh, as, as I know it. I'm ha happy to have had the chance to sh share it with you. I haven't been able to see any of the chat. In fact, I've been speaking to a, a trusting audience. I, I have no feedback from your faces either. And now I finally see Julie's smiling face. I think she's just happy that I finished talking. Um, so, so thank you for bearing with me for really a, a, a little more than an hour. And um, I, I didn't get to go through everything. I wanted to show you a demo of the new SCORE system. Uh, we're gonna be keeping working on SCORE. It's a partnership with UC Berkeley and Marsha Lynn with whom I worked year, years ago. So we're kind of building off of shared technology there. And that, that'll be in the mix for us. I don't know when we get back to sort of normal, what normal will be. Uh, you can see some of the interests that I have, and I really hope that some of the directions we were going <clears throat> will come back to us, that we, we will see kids leaning into each other again. We will see teachers close to, to them. We will see these kind of bodies in motion around the room. Uh, I, I, uh, I know that we have to deal with the cards that are given us. So right now we, we're, we're, we're sort of adjusting and trying to ask meaningful questions. Uh, but of course, everybody's sick in the head as well. So that doesn't help. We're, we're nervous and we're upset and half of us don't have enough money. And like, it's, 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 an, it's, a, it's an unsettled time <laughs> to be doing learning sciences research and so one must step with caution and one must be always aware of what, what one is actually studying. And, uh, and even those of us who are doing the work, we have our own challenges of, of showing up every day and um, we have our questions of why. 
as well to think about. So I'll leave it on that note. I'm just giving you a bit of a transparent insight into my lab, which is a, a big lab and a lot of work and activity going on. And we don't know where the normal is gonna emerge, but, but uh, I, I'm intending to take all of these ideas with me into whatever um, the case may be.